It's good. I don't have a funny intro this time around. I like Mario Party 4, and it's exactly as I remembered it. Good. Mario Party 4 has 6 boards, 8 playable characters, and 60 minigames. It has less minigames than both Mario Party 2 and Mario Party 3, but the selection this time around is the best the series has seen so far. But before I fawn over the minigames, let's go over the boards. Toad's Midway Madness. Bostonian Star Hunting Board. Simple, inoffensive board that works pretty well. Would be even better if the first set of teacups weren't a brutal infinite. <laughs> Koopa's Seaside Soiree, Bostonian Star Hunting Board. Cool board that sucks a bunch of coins out of the economy with Koopa and his cabana. The infinites here aren't as bad because the left one has an item store and the right one has the lottery shop. Dolphin happening spaces provide easy access all across the board. <coughs> Goomba's Greedy Gala, Circular Star Hunting Board. Such a chaotic board that has not one, but two infinites. The roulette gimmick is just a better version of Waluigi's Island's action time, and the Goomba dice roll-off is reminiscent of the Baby Bowser dice roll-off from Eternal Star. Also, Goomba says one of my favorite lines in any Mario Party game when you choose to not give him any coins at the roulette. Me, I like guarantees. But hey, it's your choice. I just figured that you were playing a win. Granted, it's not as good as Long Live Riddles, but it's certainly up there. <laughs> Boo's Haunted Bash, Bostonian Star Hunting Board, horribly ugly board that's actually pretty cool. The Red Boo Bridges and Mystery Train are neat elements that mix up this otherwise straight rectangular board. Soul Bummer is that there's only two happening spaces, but they're sick happening spaces. This board brought back Big Boo from Horrorland, who steals coins or stars from every player at three times the normal price. Shy Guy's Jungle Jam, Havzi's Star Hunting Board. Really solid Havzi's board, considering that both Klepto and the Shy Guy Raft provide ways for the player to cross to the other side. The only thing that would make this board better is if the river flooded until another happening space was landed on, instead of just flooding for one to three turns. Bowser's Gnarly Party, Bostonian Star Hunting Board, contains the single worst infinite in the entire series, which we'll get to later. Bowser being on the board is cool and all, but him turning all the players mini is a little much. The boards in Mario Party 4 are all pretty good. Nothing groundbreaking, but they complement the board play of Mario Party 4 well enough. The only issue with these boards is the prevalence of infinites. At this point in the series, I will put a concrete definition to what an infinite in Mario Party is, as I realize I've yet to do so. An infinite is a section of a board that traps a player, resulting in an inability to leave that section of the board by naturally rolling. In Peach's Birthday Cake, if the player chooses the Bowser Flower Seed, they go to see Bowser. From there, they loop back around to the Flower Lottery where they have the ability to choose the Bowser Seed again, theoretically ad infinitum. In Bowser Land, land on the blooper merry-go-round happening space and you go onto the merry-go-round, where you're trapped there until you land on another happening space. In Chilly Waters, if you get super unlucky, you can never leave the ice as you'll just keep tripping and falling. In Spiny Desert, players can keep rolling onto the happening spaces in the sand pits, perpetually trapping them, maybe forever. In Toad's Midway Madness, the first set of teacups leads to either the rest of the board or back to start, alternating. The first and third players, assuming they don't land on the happening spaces, get to go to the rest of the board, whereas the second and fourth players go back to start. From there, the first of those two to get back to the teacups goes to the rest of the board, and the other poor sap has to make a second lap of shame. In Goomba's Greedy Gala, if you go to either the red or the pink quadrants, the only way to go back to start and thus go to another quadrant is to lose a roll-off with Goomba, which could theoretically never happen. But to be fair, if you're in the red quadrant, you can use a mini mushroom to get to the pink quadrant, and if you're in the pink quadrant, you can land on the happening spaces to go to the blue quadrant, but my point still stands. Koopa's Seaside Soiree has two infinites, in the form of Yukiki's Banana Peel Junction, where you randomly go up or down. Going up loops you back to the Banana Peel Junction, quite possibly forever. These infinites are mellowed by the presence of the item store and lottery shop on the left and right infinites, respectively. Then there's Bowser's Gnarly Party, which has the worst infinite in the entire series. The stone bridges break after three players pass them, which then repair themselves and lead the other direction. The first of these stone bridges lies near the start, where the default position leads to the rest of the board. The first three players go to the rest of the board no problem, but the poor fourth player who lags behind gets stuck going down the alternate bridge path, which leads right back to the bridge junction. This poor, tortured soul then has to make three laps of shame before they can go to the rest of the board. The only thing that makes this infinite even remotely alright is 
is that there's an item shop along the way. Infinites in Mario Party are bad, and Mario Party 4 has the most egregious examples in the entire series. With that out of the way, we can move on to the strongest part of Mario Party 4, the minigames. While there's only 60 of them, there's not a single minigame that is downright awful, and there's only one that's subpar. Mario Party 4 has the strongest minigame track record in the series so far, but it was obtained at a substantial cost. There's no dual minigames. There's none. It's really stinky, but with minigames like Book Squirm, Dungeon Duos, Mario Speedwagons, and Trace Race, they're barely missed. There's also no more Game Guy minigames, but considering Game Guy never returned in subsequent games, I'm less beat up about it. On the bright side, Mario Party 4 reintroduces Bowser minigames, which were last seen in Mario Party 1. These can only be played when a Bowser space is landed on, and they see the loser losing either all their coins, half their coins, or all their items. I like these a lot as there's genuine risks associated with them and yet you can't lose stars. And yes, Mario Party 4 continues the tradition of a weird minigame. Goomba Stomp is based off the mechanics of Tree Stomp, but it's not nearly as elaborate as Dizzy Dingies, Driver's Ed, or even Bumper Ball Maze for that matter. But Mario Party 4 doesn't stop there. Mario Party 4 decided to one-up every Mario Party game that preceded it by having not one, not two, not five, but seven weird minigames. And just to clarify, I don't classify Challenge Bookworm and Panel Panic as weird minigames, as they're just repurposed pre-existing minigames like Mario's Puzzle Party Pro from Mario Party 3. You've got Jigsaw Jitters, Barrel Baron, Mushroom Medic, Doors of Doom, bob -omb Crossing, Beach Volley Folly, and of course, Goomba Stomp. It's genuinely obscene how many weird minigames there are in Mario Party 4. In terms of other modes, Mario Party 4 continues to one-up every other Mario Party game that preceded it. The story mode is pretty much exactly the same as the one in Mario Party 3. The plot goes something like this. It's the player character's birthday and Toad, Boo, Shy Guy, Koopa, and Goomba are each gonna give them a present. But to get the present, the player character needs to win a game of Mario Party on their respective board and beat their special minigame. Then Bowser comes and steals all the presents and makes the player play on his board and play his special minigame. Objectively, it's just all right, but relatively speaking, it's a hell of a lot better than Mario Party 3 Story Mode due to the absence of Dual Mode. The rewards for beating Story Mode are unlocking Bowser's gnarly party and getting a whole slew of presents, as well as receiving a constellation of the character you beat Story Mode with. In Minigame Mode, there are more options for how to play than ever before. Of course, you have Free Play, which is a handy way to play any minigame you've unlocked, but there's also Team Play, which is exactly like Free Play, but with only 2v2 minigames where the teams are set. I do not understand and the inclusion of team play as it seems redundant and useless. Then there's battle mode, which is basically minigame battle and battle room from Mario Parties 2 and 3 respectively, be the first to win either 3, 5, or 7 minigames. Finally, there's a new mode, tic-tac-toe mode. Players are split into two teams, then before a minigame is selected, each team chooses a space on a tic-tac-toe board. Whoever wins the minigame gets the space they chose, and the game goes until someone gets three in a row. Mario Party 4 also introduces a co-op battle royale mode, Team Match. Team Match is pretty much exactly the same as Battle Royale, except teammates can use each other's items, there's no 1v3 minigames, and at the end of the game, you and your teammates' coins and stars are totaled. I really, really like Team Match. Even more modes can be found under the Extra Room. Here we have Thwomp's Backroom Ball, Womp's Basement Brouhaha, and Beach Volley Folly. Thwomp's Backroom Ball contains Mega Board Mayhem, Mini Board Mad Dash, Challenge Book Squirm, and Panel Panic. Mega Board Mayhem and Mini Board Mad Dash are both interesting game modes where players try to obtain as many coins as possible in either 10, 20, or 30 turns. I liked Mini Board Mad Dash more. Side note, I have no idea why Challenge Book Squirm and Panel Panic are here and not in minigame mode. Womp's Basement Brouhaha contains Jigsaw Jitters, Barrel Baron, Mushroom Medic, Doors of Doom, bob -omb Crossing, and Goomba Stomp. Again, why these aren't just in minigame mode, I have no idea. Then we have Beach Volley Folly. While Goomba Stomp is the weird minigame in the classical sense, Beach Volley Folly is objectively the weirdest minigame in Mario Party 4. It's just volleyball. And it's not only just volleyball that you can play with your friends or the CPU, it's just volleyball that has a tournament mode. 
You gotta beat six matches in a row, then you can play just volleyball as Koopa, Boo, Toad, Shy Guy, Koopa Kid, and Bowser alongside the usual suspects. Imagine on-screen footage being shown of Shy Guy and Boo playing just volleyball alongside Peach and Koopa Kid. I say imagine because the battle mode in Beach Volley Volley is literally impossible. After two hours, the furthest I ever got was match four, but I lost to Koopa and Toad and gave up. So yes, I'm not gamer enough to beat Beach Volley Folly. I'll wear this shirt to my funeral. Pros and cons time. Pro. Incredible mashing minigames. While I consider Mecha Marathon to be the first true mashing minigame, Mario Party 4 perfected the genre with Domination possibly being the best mashing minigame in the entire series. Pro. Mini Mushrooms are a better version of the Skeleton Key item from Mario Parties 2 and 3. Skeleton Keys were underutilized as buying a Skeleton Key or getting one in an item minigame is unbelievably small-brained. Mini mushrooms work better because players naturally come into them by landing on mushroom spaces. Pro. Everything looks much nicer. The boards are still flat, but it's not ugly. Like, look at that water. This game was released in 2002. On a similar note, running and jumping feels a lot better in the minigames now. Pro. Mushroom boxes. These are such an ingenious idea. They expedite the item obtaining process so much. This and the questionnaires from Mario Party 3 are how all item obtaining should be done. Quick 10 second interactions that grant the player an item while maintaining a sense of player agency and not boring the other players. Pro. Lottery shop. I love gambling, and this is just like actual gambling. For five coins, you either draw a ball or choose a scratcher, where you can win a mushroom, 30 coins, or 100 coins. It's so great. Pro. Lucky party ticket. The first time each player arrives at the lottery shop, they get a lottery ticket. During the last five turns event, the winning ticket is drawn. If the player has that ticket, they win a star. This is peak Mario Party, randomly being awarded a star for doing next to nothing. Pro. Lucky minigames. Randomly, the minigame will be a lucky minigame, where the coins won are multiplied by 1, 2, or 3. Pro. The player who lands on a battle minigame space gets to choose what battle minigame is played. I just think it's nice that there's some agency on the matter. Pro. The last five turns roulette. During the last five turns event, after the lucky party ticket gets drawn, the player in last place is brought in to stop a roulette that slightly alters the game. The possible outcomes here are the coin values of blue and red spaces being doubled, all red spaces becoming fortune spaces, all red spaces becoming Bowser spaces, and making stars free to buy. Pro. Team match. I. Love. Team match. Pro. Bowser minigames. I'm glad they were brought back. Pro. Custom minigame sets. On top of having easy and all minigame sets, you can now create your own custom minigame set. This is so cool. You pick a minimum of four four player, three 2v2, three 1v3, and two battle minigames for your custom minigame set. I love this so much because, as I've adamantly stated throughout this series, Mario Party needs to be customized to fit the player's fancy. Con. Four out of the six boards have infinites. Yada yada yada, infinites are bad, I've spoken enough on the matter today. Con. Hidden blocks still move, but there's only one in play at a time. When you find the hidden block, it's a 50-50 whether you get 20 coins or a star. This means no more items in hidden blocks as well. Con. Items got renamed. It's super minor, but the lucky lamp was renamed the chomp call, the warp block became the warp pipe, the boo repellent became the gad light, and the boo bell became boo's crystal ball. The only new name I like is boo's crystal ball. Boo repellent, however, is the greatest loss. The name's just so goofy. Con. Many mushroom mini games. These are mini games that can only be played if pass while mini. Every board has two of them. One where the prize is coins and one where the prize is an item. They're cool because they make the mini mushroom more useful, but they're simply unnecessary and muck up the pacing of the game. Also, apparently they're not actually considered mini games according to the Super Mario Wiki, which is where I've been getting most of my research for these videos from, which is why I didn't list them with the rest of the mini games. I don't get it either. Con. Chance time is wacky. Not only was it given an inferior name in the way of reversal of fortune, but it was changed from hitting blocks to playing pinball. I wish I was joking. It takes far too long and genuinely baffles me why they decided to do chance time dirty like this. Con. No dual minigames, but we've already been over that. Con. No more banks. I like those spaces a lot. Con. Taunts got nerfed. You can no longer spam them. You have to wait until the taunt is completely finished before taunting again. Con. Warp spaces. Just kinda stinky. And no, I will not justify my reasoning or elaborate further. Con. No more Bowser Roulette. 
I really enjoyed seeing what could possibly happen when landing on a Bowser space. Having Koopa Kid or Bowser come down from the sky is just kinda anticlimactic. Landing on a Bowser space should be this big event, but Mario Party 4 just kinda streamlines the process, which can be argued as a good thing, I just happen to disagree. I consider Mario Party 4 to be the first truly modern Mario Party game. It distances itself from the Nintendo 64 Mario Parties, which I will refer to as the classic trilogy from here on out. It follows in the footsteps of Mario Party 2 while not being afraid to change mechanics as it sees fit. Yet at the same time it doesn't try to follow up on Mario Party 3 and instead heads in a new direction. This new direction is the natural progression of the success of Mario Party 2 and the failure of Mario Party 3, and it accomplished an incredible amount for the series debut on the GameCube while simultaneously setting up future installments for surefire success. Take what worked in Mario Party 4, do it again, but better, and you have an instant hit on your hands. After all, that's how Mario Party 2 was so good. It took Mario Party 1 and did it again, but better. But the question is, is it better than Mario Party 2? Yes. That's a very reluctant yes, because while Mario Party 2 is so good, the advent of more accessibility options like handicaps and minigame settings, along with the additional bonus content in Mario Party 4, makes it the superior game. Here's the current ranking of the Mario Party games. With that being said, it should come as no surprise that there are plenty of aspects to salvage here. Mushroom boxes, Bowser minigames, the lottery shop, lucky party tickets, the lucky minigames, team match, the last five turns roulette, custom minigame sets, and the ability to choose what battle minigame is played. Now while I'd be happy to salvage any and all minigames from Mario Party 4, I'll just settle for Domination, Book Score, Mario Speedwagons, and Dungeon Duos. Domination is one of, if not the best mashing minigame, and the other three are some of the most expertly crafted minigames in the entire series. Next time we'll be looking at Mario Party 5, where we'll see if Mario Party 4 did in fact set up future entries for surefire success. I don't think it did, but there's only one way to be certain. And to fulfill my quota for clerical duties, here's the compiled list of every salvage mechanic and minigame, separated into trilogies. Take care.